Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Today, uh, I got uh, the dry erase markers and uh, we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some fun. So, the Bible says that there are two ways to be wise. So there's man's wisdom, and there's God's wisdom, right? Okay. So man's wisdom is on one side, and God's wisdom is on the other. What we're going to do tonight is we're going to let the Bible make the distinction between man's wisdom and God's wisdom, so that we can make an educated decision of which one we want to base our life on. Because as I've said before many, many times, and those of us who are disciples, we know this to be true, is that God loves us enough to give us the choice of whether or not we're going to live based on man's wisdom or his wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look here in verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the message of the cross, meaning Jesus dying on the cross, is foolishness, to those who are perishing. By the way, you don't want to be somebody who's perishing. And and sadly, most people in this generation think that they are not, when in fact they are. So it's not an issue of where you want to be in a position where you don't know, or whether you think. You want to have an assurance that you're not the one that's perishing. Am I right? It says, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? College students, you're like, amen, my professor needs to hear this. Like, this is dumb. Calculus, this is dumb. God says this is dumb. Just give me an A and let me move on, right? So in this passage, where does the cross, where does Jesus dying on the cross, where does that belong? Man's wisdom or God's wisdom? Well, obviously from the passage, we understand where it belongs, and it belongs in the wisdom of God. So how does God in his wisdom view the cross? He views it as the power of God. He says specifically, the cross is the power of God. You know, Ariel and I had a a friend of ours when we were living in uh, Walnut Creek and leading the region out there in San Francisco in Contra Costa. Her name was Ina. She's a Russian-born gal, spent most of her life in Russia. Uh, She's now down in L.A. She's got two daughters that are disciples down there in L.A. It's awesome. But I remember Ariel came home, was talking to, um, was talking with her, and Ariel made this comment like, yeah, Ina said, God is stupid. (laughs) And, you know, us Americans, we'd be like, excuse me? Now, we're not like Islam where we need to defend our God. God is big enough that he can defend himself, Right. Right. Now, I'll defend the people of God, but I don't need to defend God. God's job is to defend me. I don't need to defend him. But, like, those are fighting words, man. What are you talking about? God is stupid. And in the way that she talks, what she meant was, the way that God deals with my sin is dumb. Why would anyone do that? I blow it every day, all the time, and yet God's grace still covers me. Because I became a disciple, I've gotten baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Because I'm free from sin, but that's God. God did that for me. That's stupid. Right? So most of us would be like, excuse me, sis? Like, what? What are you talking about? 
and we would like hop into getting offended. But Ariel in her wisdom was like, okay, well, help me understand where you're coming from here. You know what I mean? Wise thing to do. See, the reality is that we, we, just as we can view God's wisdom as foolishness, so God sees man's wisdom as foolishness. If, you, if I think that you're a fool, and you think that I'm a fool, how far are we going to get in our relationship? We're not going anywhere. I had a guy uh, reach, out to us, reach out to me on our church's website. And, you know, normally that's pretty cool, you know, somebody wanting to know where we're meeting and stuff like that. It's like, what is your position on X, Y, and Z topic? That was what, that was the, the context of the email. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to answer this over email because I have no context. I, I don't know what this guy's after. Like, let's, okay, well, let's set up a time we can meet. He didn't live, I looked at his email address. He lived in the UK. So obviously he's like not some, so we got on Zoom. And this guy wanted to know, he set up this Zoom call so that, he, so that I could teach him about what we believe as a church about these particular topics. And they happen to be pretty hotly contested topics in the religious world. Uh, not hotly contested topics in the Bible. The Bible's pretty clear about it, which I had all the confidence that I could teach him what he needed to be taught. But the reality is that as we got into the conversation... He, he was not even willing to pray with me. I'm like, hey, let's pray before we start this Bible study. I don't need to pray with you. I'm like, oh, oh okay, I, I, I see how this is going to go. He's like, hey, if you want to like stop the Zoom and come back in an hour after you've had an, ad, a, an opportunity to pray about this, you should have prayed before we got here. And I'm like, okay, uh, I did, but I thought it might be nice for the two of us to do so. But hey, you know, amen, you know, I'm trying to be cool. You know what I mean? I'm trying to you know, win the guy over a little bit, you know? Uh, so long story short, he had no interest in me answering any questions of his. Literally, I would bring up a scripture and he said, oh, I've already read all these before. There's nothing you can say that, that would change my mind about what I believe on these things. And I was like, then why are we having this conversation? Like, what's the point? You know, I was flipping through um, Instagram a, 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 a few months ago and came across a video of a, a woman who goes on college campuses and, you know, asks tough questions. And she gave some really wise wisdom, some sage wisdom for her years. And she said, the first question that I ask anybody that I meet with, and I say, if I could provide you evidence, would that would you change your mind? Wow. And if their answer is no, then I'm walking away from the conversation. It doesn't matter. Wow. Because if I'm entrenched in what I believe, and they're entrenched in what they believe, then what's the point? It's a foolish and stupid argument, as Paul calls uh, Timothy to not get into those in his book. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, we can be the same way with God. God, you're stupid because this isn't true. I don't believe this. Well, if I could offer you information that would help you change your mind, would you be willing to pay attention? Would you be willing to change your mind? If that answer tonight is no, then you're in the wrong seat. Now, because you're here and you, somebody invited you to a devotional, <laughs> I'm assuming that you would like to hear what God has to say about who's foolish and who's wise. Amen? Amen. Amen. But we've got to understand, we must be willing to be persuaded by God's word about what is wise and what is foolish. If we're locked into our side without the option of being open to changing based on new information, then we are destined to be fools. What is the relationship between wisdom of man and wisdom of God? Go to James chapter 4. What is the nature of the relationship between the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God? 
We are dealing with two things going in opposite directions. They are two totally opposite thought processes. Completely opposed to one another. James chapter 4, look here in verse 4. The Bible says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against or hatred towards God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So here's what we see here. We've got the cross, which is the wisdom of God, which is foolishness. according to man's wisdom, but according to God, God's wisdom is foolishness according to man, and man's wisdom is foolishness according to God. The power of God is in the cross. But we see that they are completely opposed to one another, going in two completely opposite directions. Go back to 1 Corinthians. In this case, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look here in verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. The Bible says, Do not deceive yourselves, which gives an indication that we can deceive ourselves. If any of you thinks you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. What does he mean by he must become a fool? Well, You've got to exchange the wisdom of this age, man's wisdom, for God's wisdom, which, according to man, is foolish. Why would you listen to the Bible when you can listen to your professors, or you can listen to the pundits on TV, or you can listen to Jordan Peterson, or whatever, pick your YouTube personality. I mean, those guys are so wise. Again, what's the strong message here? God's wisdom and man's wisdom are totally opposite one another. You can't straddle the fence. That's what I'm here to tell you. The gulf is way too wide. I mean, it's only a couple inches here in this drawing, but the reality is they are light years apart. You can't have one foot in man's wisdom and yet one foot in God's wisdom. It doesn't work that way. You're either all in or you're all in. Go to Matthew chapter 16. The reality of all of our lives is that we are on one side or the other. Right here today, each and every one of you in this room, including myself, are on one side or the other. Matthew 16, look here in verse 13. Matthew 16, verse 13. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, I love this, son of Jonah, For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. What Jesus is saying here is like, hey, Peter, you are not smart enough to figure that one out on your own, buddy. That came from God. And Simon is like, yeah, you're right. (laughs) You know. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed 
and on the third day rise again. Now, Peter is coming off of an awesome situation. He got the question right, the $100 million question, 100%. He's fired up. I got it right, Jesus. Hey, buddy. Hey, Andrew. It's me, John. You thought you're the beloved apostle. Nuh-uh. I got it right. You know what I'm saying? Watch what happens. Peter took him aside. Jesus, Jesus, come here, come here. Come here. Right, let, let, let's, have a, let's have a little chat. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. He said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Oh, how the mighty fall. Literally five minutes before, he's like, I got it right. Now we got it wrong. And if you read about Peter, this is his world. You know what I mean? In this passage, we see Peter using his head as a blunt instrument. And again, as he's done time and time again, put his foot in his mouth. And this time he rebukes Jesus. I mean, can you imagine that? Rebuking Jesus. Now, now forget the Jesus that we know because we've read about him and all this stuff. Like, just think about the Jesus at that time. You've seen him turn water into wine. You've seen him perform miracles. You've seen him teach about love and all the, and these cool things. You know what I mean? You've seen him, like, make a whip out of cords and drive people out of the temple. Like, this is a serious dude. And yet Peter had the guts. I, I, I appreciate Peter's guts. He had the guts to rebuke Jesus. A rebuke, if you didn't know, isn't like something we do to demons, okay? The religious world has hijacked this word. What it means is a strong correction. So it's like an employee of a company walking, this is like an employee of the company walking into the board meeting and like telling the CEO how to run his company. It's just not a good situation. And what was Jesus' response? Stop thinking like a man. Stop Thinking by human standards. You do not have in mind the things of God, but you have in mind the things of man. Again, we do not straddle the fence. You are either thinking like God or you are thinking like human. You're either walking the way of God or you're walking the way of man. You cannot do both. Jesus is clear. No wonder it's the opposite of God's wisdom. Now, to be sure, there's some universal truth. I know, I know somebody in this audience is saying, but Eric, like some worldly wisdom works. Yeah, it does. First of all, worldly wisdom works because Satan has a vested interest in making sure that it works. However, do you think that God's principles only work when God wants them to work or do they work all the time because they're God's timeless principles? See, what God creates, Satan counterfeits, or he corrupts. He will use God's principles, the things that actually work, and he will use them for his end. I'll prove it to you. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 16. I mean, think about about how you've grown up and the things that you've been taught in your life. What do you learn from television? What do you learn from the streets? What do you learn from movies? What do you learn from talk shows? You learn, look out for number one. Get what you want. Get the power. Get the pleasure. Control everything. Get the money. Protect yourself. Guard your rights. Maintain your independence. Get a good lawyer, whatever it may be. But here we find something rather interesting in Matthew 16. Look here in verse 24. It says... Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or can anyone give, or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So here's what we find. Here's what we find. We find over here Two circles. And in the middle of man's wisdom, the circle, is the self. It is the self. Our needs. Who's at the center? We are. 
You are. You are at the center under man's wisdom. Your needs, your thoughts, your desires, your wants, your ways. Whatever you want. What is Jesus' message here, though? What's His wisdom all about? It's the opposite. It's God is in the center. Now, many of you have heard me say this before, but our world today is full of people who deny themselves. Many of you to come here have denied yourself. Good for you. That's awesome. But who did you deny yourself for? That's the question. Right? You pull up the latest podcast. Again, the latest YouTube influencer. They're talking about, man, if you don't want to go to the gym, just go to the gym. Take that ice shower or that ice bath or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Right? Hey, hey, save your money. Don't just spend it frivolously. Right? All that's denial of self. Because what do we want to do? We want to sleep in. We don't want to go to the gym. We want to eat the whole pizza pizza, not a salad. You know what I'm saying? We want to spend, hey, I grew up, here's the refrain my parents told me every day when I grew up, as I was growing up. Hey, man, I really would like to have that. Save your money. Hey, 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 dad, can I? Save your money. Save your money. So when I got old enough and I got a paycheck, do you know what I did with my money? No. I spent all of it. And I'll out my age a little bit. I spent it on CDs. Actually, I spent it on tapes before that, but CDs mostly. All right? But the reality is that we, we do deny ourselves. We deny ourselves every day. We got some parents in the room. Y'all, we're denying ourselves every second of every day. But who's, who are we denying ourselves for? Notice what he says. He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. So it's not just simply denying yourself. It's denying yourself for the sake of Christ. It's losing your life for Christ. What is Jesus' message? Do it for me. Don't do it for you. Now, sometimes that matches, and it's a wonderful thing. Sometimes what I want to do is what God wants me to do. Right. Amen to that. Yay. But not always. And in that case, it's not really denying myself because I want to do it anyway. So it's, it's only denial of self when you don't want to do it and you do it anyway. This is definitely a radical message. Let's break it down a little further. What does it mean then to deny yourself? Well, the Greek root word is Eranoni, which means to disown. It means to disown. What does it mean if you disown your parents or you disown your son or your daughter? What is, that, that, that means that, that you don't spend time with them, that you don't give them money, you don't give them riches, you don't, you don't, you don't do anything for them. Not right now. There's no calls, there's no letters, there's, no, there's none of that. Mm -hmm. Now, some of us have felt that, right? Some of us have felt that, that disowning of our family, the disowning of somebody in our life, mm -hmm. right? For sure. So we know what that looks like and that feels like on the other side. Yeah. But here, the word Jesus used is very, very interesting. It is aparanomi. Ap in the Greek means utterly. So it's not just disown, it's completely disown. That means leave no trace of it. There's nothing of yourself left. Deny yourself, disown yourself, completely and utterly disown yourself is what Jesus is saying right here. Wow. That's nuts. Who can do that? You can do that 
by the power of God. Amen. Come on. Jesus saying that we all have lived on man's side. We've got to put, we, we, we put that self at the center, but we have to change that. And God has to be at the center. We've got to totally disown that old person. Next, he says, to take up your cross. Deny themselves, which means lose your life for Jesus. And then he says, take up your cross and follow me. What does he mean by take up your cross? Well, what did Jesus do on the cross? Died. So what do you have to do? Die. Now, wait a second, Eric. That's got to be figurative. I mean, who really dies for their faith these days? Okay, welcome to America. The chances of us having to die for our faith is like less than zero. But there's not a week that goes by that I do not get an email about brothers and sisters all over this world who are actually dying for their faith. Worse yet, they're getting beat, they're getting raped, they're getting mutilated all over the place because they chose not to be a Muslim, but they chose to be a Christian. They chose not to be a Hindu, they chose to be a disciple of Jesus. Does the Bible read differently in different countries, or is it the same Bible? Did Jesus have a different standard for those that are in America than those that are in Latin America? I mean, it has America in it, so it's got to be the same, right? No. There's no, st- there's no difference in the standard. And yet, we as Americans think that there is. No. No. If called for it, you actually have to die. Wow. Period. Period. Every single apostle died for their faith. Yeah. And one of them lived to a ripe old age, but he was boiled in oil and lived. Wow. And what some of us think we got a bat. And then was kicked off to an island by himself. So we actually have to. But here's the reality. God's not asking any of us to die right now. Nope. But he is asking us to die to ourselves. Amen. Come on. That's foolishness. Even some of you sitting in this room are like, that's dumb. I don't know what Bible you're reading. I didn't grow up with that. Well, you grew up with the Bible that you didn't read, probably. Or your pastor didn't read it. Because that's what it says. And for most of us here, it's in red letters. So it ain't even Eric saying this is Jesus. Right. Now you understand when he says to totally disown yourself. What about take up your cross? We talked about that. What about follow me? You cannot follow Jesus without doing the things we just mentioned. I mean, isn't that what he said? He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me for whoever wants to save life. He said, if you want to. This isn't even that you are. This is the cover charge to being a disciple of Jesus. Wow. Elsewhere, he says, if you don't do certain things, you cannot be my disciple. Write this down, Luke 14. Luke 9. You cannot be a disciple. When Jesus says you cannot, does that mean like, oh, with, with, with man this is impossible, with God all things are possible, so I actually can? No, that means Jesus is saying you can't. And he's telling us to do things very similar to this. It's tough. This is a radical, radical, radical following that Jesus is calling us to. And it's absolute foolishness. But to God... To those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. You guys can clap if you want. What does Jesus say the bottom line will be for people who live on man's side? They lose their life. They lose their life. You might be able to live it up on this earth, have a good time but you won't, have a, you won't have eternal life with God. This is what I tell people all the time. Like, hey, if you don't want to be a Christian, totally cool. Like, I'm sad. I'm bummed. 
But like totally cool. God loves you enough that you can go and live the way that you want. And let me tell you, don't fake it. Like go all out. Go to every party, drink every drink, take every drug. Do everything you want to do. Watch every Netflix film you could possibly imagine. Do it all. Just don't call yourself a Christian because you make my life more miserable because now I have to deal with your hypocrisy and try to talk people into this. We were, Jay and I were having a Bible study with a guy just this other day, supposed to be here. And, uh, and his big thing was, why do I have to go to church? And I'm like, well, he's like, isn't this church? I was like, yeah, it is. But that's not all church. It's like 25% church. <laughs> he's like, well, I, I, you know, I, I just, I don't see the correlation. And I'm like, okay, well, let's look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 says that Christ is the head of the church. So if I cut off the head and I'm the body, how long is that body going to live? It's not going to live, right? <laughs> not too long is an understatement, right? It's, it's just not. It's dead. You know what I mean? Now, if I cut my finger off, there's a point in time where that finger is still allowable to like get sewed back on. I'll never have it fully 100%, but at least it can come back on and I can have some range of motion. But you cannot have a relationship with Jesus and not have a relationship with his body. The reality for this man is that it was foolishness to do it God's way. It's foolishness to do it God's way. And yet he wasn't even willing to try to do it God's way. He was stuck. He was stuck in his foolishness. The bottom line for those foolish people who lose their lives for his sake is they will actually find their life. All of us are not living our real life. If you're not a disciple of Jesus today, you're living a fake life. You're not living a real life. And you know it. You know you're living a fake life. Because you go and hang out with fake friends. You, you go and, and fake it in your classes. You go and fake it at work. You're, you're not happy. You fake happiness. Why? Because deep down inside, you know that you're not living God's way. You know there's something wrong. I did. I did growing up. I wanted to have a relationship with God. I, I wanted to uh, uh, be close to God. But I had no one in my life to teach me what this Bible said. And for the lack of, you, know, you, you try to read it. But unless someone guides me, as it says in Acts chapter 8, how can I understand it? And so God moved me from Alaska to Southern California to live with my brother-in-law and sister so that my brother-in-law could send the Bible with me and I could see the truth and actually live a life, actually save my life, actually get it back and really live. Jesus' own death, burial, and resurrection is proof of what he taught. So, here's the diagram as we've looked at it so far. We've got God's wisdom, we've got God's wisdom, we've got man's wisdom. We know that the cross is the power of God, which is foolishness to man, but we know that man's wisdom is foolishness to God. Am I right? Yeah. We know that at the center of man's wisdom is the self. We do what we want to do. And so, here, I'm going to save my life. Right? And what am I going to end up doing? I'm going to end up losing it. But over here, with God's wisdom, I'm actually going to take up my cross. Right? And I'm going to lose my life. And what's going to be the outcome? I'm actually going to save it. I'm going to save it. few additional thoughts as we wrap up. What is everything on this side of the column called? It's a three-letter word. It starts with an S, ends in an N, has an I in the middle. Sin. What is everything on this side called? Love. Sin and love. Living a life of love. Go to Acts chapter 2. Love for God, love for others, 
living for God and living for others. Acts chapter 2. One more thing to add on to here is the denial of self, which is really putting our lives on the cross. Acts chapter 2, look here in verse 36. The Bible says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. What does this passage tell us? It tells us that repentance and baptism bring forgiveness for all of man's sins and the power of the Holy Spirit to live God's plan. So here's what this looks like. Repent, right? Which means to turn from your sin. Right? Repentance is metanoia. It's a change of mind that results in a change of behavior. Mm -hmm. Most of us have never repented a day in our lives. Because all we do is they change our mind, and that does not result in a change of behavior. This is why you keep going back over and over and over and over into those same sins that you keep trying to get rid of, but you can't. And then you get baptized. Baptized means baptizo in the Greek, which is to be immersed, immersed in water. And what do we get here? We get forgiveness. Forgiveness over here, specifically of our sins, right? And then we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that enables us to live this take up your cross, lose your life to save it. The reality is that anybody can be baptized. But if you haven't repented, that baptism is just you getting wet. I can remember vividly at 13 years of age, getting a nice flowing blue gown on. I only wore a dress twice in my life. That was the first one. The second one, if you look on my Facebook page, you might see back in October 31st of... 2007 or something like that. 2000 and stupid, that's what that was. But the reality is that I remember, because I got in and it just floated. And then my dad dunked me underwater. But here's the, here's the thing. I never repented of anything. Nobody ever taught me about sin. Nobody ever taught me about being a disciple. Nobody told me what the Bible said about anything. I just did it because my brother did it at camp two weeks earlier. My sister had done it a few years earlier than that. That was it. So, hey, I guess, I, I guess this is what we do. No wonder my life did not change until I was 20 years old and moved to California. Because then I actually repented of my sin. I actually changed my life. Because I knew, first of all, what I needed to repent of. Most of us walk around, and we know, obviously we know. If we're sleeping around, doing drugs, I mean, there's like the, pick the big ones, right? You already know you need to repent of that, so just do so. But it's deeper than that. It's not just stopping doing wrong. Repentance is stopping doing wrong and starting to do right. But how do you know where to do right? It only comes from God's wisdom. But if you're living over here, you know nothing about God's wisdom. So let's make it a little personal. Not that it hasn't been already. Question for you to answer on your own. How have you lived according to man's wisdom? What are your greatest tendencies in that direction? 
Meaning, what are the areas of your life that you need to repent of? Which side was Peter on? Here's an even deeper question. Which side would Jesus say that you're on? Which one do you want to be on more? My challenge to each and every one of us tonight, especially those of us that are not baptized disciples, is you've got to get into the Word of God in order to understand God's wisdom. You cannot live this out on your own. And trust me, you know your lives. You know that you've been trying to live it out on your own. And let me tell you something, it ain't working out. So you have a choice. You can keep living over here, and you're going to keep getting the same results. It's not going to change. Or you can repent, metanoia, change your mind, which results in a change of your behavior. Learn what the Bible says about God's wisdom. How do you know what God's plan is? You've got to get into the Bible. It's the only thing that's going to change your life. So that's my challenge for you tonight, is live by God's wisdom and not by man's wisdom. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.